Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from Geneva. Uh, my apologies, uh, my name is Jim Campbell. I'm the director of the Health Workforce Department in the headquarters team here. Uh, my apologies that we're a couple of minutes late, just making sure that the technology for today's webinar uh, was uh, fit for purpose. Uh, but welcome to uh, a discussion today. I'm joined by uh, Dr. Mark Springer from the antimicrobial resistance team here, uh, our guest, Dr. Nandini Shetty, and we'll be joined by Professor Kumud Kasli from Nepal as well, presenting to you the work today on the health workers' education and training on antimicrobial resistance. Uh, this is the success from a joint collaboration across the technical teams at headquarters and with Public Health England, and also an extensive outreach to healthcare professional associations over the last two years and a little bit. It is very much helping towards driving the WHO Global Action Plan on AMR, uh, and responding to particular elements of that action plan in terms of how we look at education and learning standards around the world to be also fit for purpose. We have uh, an hour um, scheduled for today's webinar. We will try to keep on schedule even though we're a few minutes late in starting uh, so that um, we have an opportunity for some, inter some, some presentations for you first and then we will try to ensure a question and answers a little later in the session. So thank you very much for joining us. A big thanks to the many experts, uh, colleagues and staff that have been actively engaged in developing this, this guide. And we look forward to engaging with you, um, not just today, but beyond in terms of how this can be implemented. So I'd like to hand uh, over to Dr. Mark Springer for a few remarks linked to the context of this in antimicrobial resistance. Mark. Thank you very much, Jim. So in 2015, the WHO launched the Global Action Plan on AMR. Important to tackle the alarming rise of antimicrobial resistance and also to ensure our ability to treat and prevent infections, infectious diseases with antibiotics, not only now, but also in the future. Now, among the many actions and institutions and organizations that can implement, ultimately, our collective goal is to enable appropriate use, not too much, but also access to antibiotics. And that vital link is strengthened through education of the prescribers because they play a key role. Now, the first objective of this global action plan on AMR is to improve awareness and understanding of antimicrobial resistance through effective communication, education, and training. Now, that's why today we are really so pleased that our colleagues in the Health Workforce Department are unveiling the Curricula Guide for Health Workers Education and Training on AMR. And we know that evidence shows that the health workers and students really want to boost their knowledge and level of competency through effective education and training on AMR. And this is what my colleagues have accomplished in collaboration with the Public Health England. Now, I should also mention that next week, the WHO will launch a practical toolkit for implementing AMR stewardship programs in healthcare facilities in low and middle income countries. Now, the toolkit aims at supporting countries in developing the necessary structures at the national and hospital level for antimicrobial stewardship. Now, strengthening the competencies of healthcare workers on the key principles of stewardship and infection control is really central to sustaining action and ensuring impact. 
the healthcare curricula launched today will pay a vi will pl play a vital role in building these competencies in the countries. Now, these WHO tools and guidance on AMR, like the health worker competency framework, the curricula uh, guide and hospital toolkit are intended to be a complementary suite of resources aimed at maximizing the health workers' contributions to control AMR. Now, our next task is to implement this curricula globally and refine our approach. Now, this can only be accomplished with further collaboration and input from you, uh, our invaluable network of experts, partners, and educators. Now, for instance, we really would like to use implementation case studies to further to further our understanding, along with uh, piloting an AMR assessment tool for health worker education and training. Now, I certainly welcome my colleagues sitting with me to dive into the details uh, as they are truly experts in this field. And we applaud them for the journey that they have taken to launch this guide for health workers education on training on antimicrobial resistance. Thank you very much, Mark, for uh, that introduction into some of the work. Uh, what we'd like to do now is to give the floor to our, our, our guest here today, but I, I feel like our partner from Public Health England. Um, one of the, the real values and privileges of working at the World Health Organization is indeed the partnership and the convening role. Uh, Dr. Nandini Shetty has a uh, impressive biography as a leading expert in this field, and we've really valued the partnership process. Uh, Dr. Shetty, Nandini, if I may, please, if you are able then to take us through some of the, the, the value of the curricular guide that we're presenting today. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you, Mark. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, webinar launch of the curricular guide uh, that we have been speaking of so far. I thank you all, all of you for taking time to attend this webinar, and it is my pleasure and privilege to walk you through the curricular guide and explain how you may be able to use it. Now, the whole concept of the curricular guide, as you have heard from Mark, rises from what is now a well-known fact, and that is AMR poses a serious threat to global public health and it is critical to achieving the sustainable development goals that we control it. Mark has already talked about the very first point on the Global Action Plan, and that is to, um, to increase knowledge and, um, and awareness through education and training, and that is what we have addressed here. We accept that education and training needs to be wide-ranging with a multidisciplinary involvement. So, why do we need a curricular guide? We did a piece of work with the, with the, the team here in the Health Education Workforce Department, and we realized that educational institutions and learned bodies in many countries have developed local AMR educational curricula and courses. There is evidence that gaps remain, though, in terms of access to a standardized curriculum that can be accepted and adapted locally. So to this end, the WHO Health Workforce Department and the AMR Secretariat sourced a, an expert consultative group, and together we worked to produce an interprofessional competency framework for AMR education of health workers. I don't know whether you can see my slides, okay. um, but I will you bear with me for a minute, and I we will show you what these documents look like. I uh, want to show you what the WHO Competency Framework document looked like that was created in 2018, and that led to the curricular guide which we are launching today. Okay, so there we are. 
uh, I hope you can see that. Um, in 2018, we created a WHO competency framework uh, you, with this, this, this expert consultative group, and today in 2019, we are launching the full document. So, um, the expert consultative group had a wide-ranging representation, and they provided input into the creation of this competency framework. And the competency framework describes the overarching purpose. And it was to provide guidance to ensure that health workers are properly equipped with the competencies they need to combat the spread of AMR. We were focusing on the human aspect of the comprehensive One Health approach to tackling AMR uh, in, in this document. And I'm sure there are, uh, there are many opportunities to expand it to, to the other, our other colleagues who work with AMR. So this particular competency framework um, stated that the target users of the curricular guide would be pre-service and in-service health education and training institutions and their students, accreditation and licensing bodies, and health policy and decision-making authorities. So, who was the curricula um, uh, guide meant for? It was agreed that, it, um, that the guide should be used by teachers and trainers to address the learning needs of four main categories of health worker grouping, identifying competencies needed for each of them. So these included prescribers of antimicrobial agents, non-prescribers, public health officers and health services managers, and health workers in supportive care roles. So the competency framework laid out the major domains which would form the structure of the curricular guide, and we have adhered to these major domains right across the curricular guide. And these include foundations that build awareness of antimicrobial resistance, appropriate use of antimicrobial agents, infection prevention and control, or IPC, as I will say from now on, and diagnostic stewardship and surveillance. As the document evolved, we added ethics, leadership, communication, and governance, because we felt this was really important to the whole learning process. Now, I'd like to take you through the approach to training and education in AMR, which I think has to be a multidisciplinary model. So this entire curricular guide in, in all its aspects is patient-centered. So let's say a patient walks into a healthcare facility and that patient has a clinical evaluation. That leads to diagnostic stewardship by our clinical colleagues and very simply what that means is after clinical history taking and evaluation, the clinician takes the right sample for the right test at the right time. So this diagnosis, so we have to address clinical recognition and management of infection at that patient-centered focus in this curriculum. This then leads to the test being, the specimen being sent to the microbiology laboratory where there is a quality assured, standardized, harmonized methodology of testing, which will produce a result. So the curricular guide needs to address scientists who work in the laboratory and provide this service for us. The diagnostic test is then interpreted and reported back to the clinician, and a whole process that comprises antimicrobial stewardship is put in place, which is very simply means the right antimicrobial is given at the right time, dose, route, and duration. And this involves a whole partnership of people, including the clinical colleagues, the pharmacists, nurses, epidemiologists, and data managers. And these are the people that also need to be included in this curricular guide. Eventually, we, we believe an appropriate diagnosis and treatment will ensue and hopefully follow-up and outcome data will also be collected. Associated with this process are two very important processes. One is surveillance. And this surveillance I'm talking about is surveillance of 
that comes out of the laboratory. The name of the organisms is and their antimicrobial susceptibility results that will directly impact treatment guidelines and usage policies in a healthcare facility. It will also inform empirical antibiotic therapy based on local guidance and surveillance data. It also informs antimicrobial usage data. Together with this, we must not forget infection prevention and control, and all our colleagues who work in the Department of Infection Prevention and Control, because the, trans the, the entire process of health protection for our patients against infectious diseases and transmission, preventing transmission of infection is based on good IPC. So this is the multidisciplinary approach we have taken, and we have addressed the curricular guide to, to be used for all of these health care worker cadres. So if you look at this, um, this matrix model that we have used, what is going horizontally across your screen are the common themes that all healthcare workers will learn about to some degree or other. And this includes the basic biology of bacteria, viruses, parasites, and fungi, common infection syndromes in the community and hospital, use of antimicrobial agents, emergence of resistance, infection prevention and control, diagnostic stewardship and surveillance, and ethics, leadership, communication, and governance. So on the right of the screen that you're looking at, you see the green um, channel. Now that is the basic introduction and um, essential AMR learning uh, outcomes and objectives, focusing on a curriculum at its most basic, tailored to the particular health workers in your facility uh, that is applicable to health workers in supportive care roles. You then go to the, 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 the rest of the curriculum, and these comprise learning objectives and outcomes tailored specifically for different cadres of health workers. So there's a curriculum for those who prescribe antimicrobial agents. There's a curriculum for non-prescribers. And within this, um, within this body, there is a detailed curriculum for pharmacists, nurses, and laboratory scientists. And then there's a curriculum for public health officers and health service managers. These are, these, this curriculum is targeted to those individuals who have senior decision-making roles and have responsibility for budget allocation. And it's very important that we educate them about the importance of AMR. So we recognize that the, the many institutions that we have that that we have dealt with in our in our expert consultative group and all of the institutions out there may already cover much of the content that we are presenting here in their diverse subjects such as microbiology, pharmacology, and patient safety courses. And the syllabi for health education and training programs may already be full of competing needs. We understand this. And this is why we created a series of standalone modular packages. So there are modules, and you have the chance to incorporate only the relevant modules or sub-modules when creating an integrated AMR curriculum for your students. So users can ensure balance and effectiveness in their teaching programs. So let me give you an example of a modular approach. Let's take this mo the, the modules that as I have described them. So the modules are foundations that build awareness of antimicrobial resistance. So that's, that's from, the, uh, say from the curriculum guide for prescribers. Now, underneath that, there are sub-modules. And you'll find there's one that says eliciting a clinical history and performing a clinical examination relevant to prescription of antimicrobial agents and so forth. Under the appropriate use of antimicrobial agents, there are sub-modules on use of antimicrobial agents in clinical management, safe use of antimicrobial agents, stewardship, and governance. So you can see that each module has specific sub-modules for each of the healthcare workers, um, cadres of workers that we have addressed in this guide. So if you 
look at the module in, in detail, each module has a competency statement. And the competency statement tells you what that module is designed to deliver. So the competency statement of, of the, the module that I've just described is that the prescriber demonstrates that they have the knowledge and awareness of effective approaches to reduce the emergence and control the spread of antimicrobial resistance and the skills and attitudes to implement change according to their role and level of training. So if you look at the sub-module that we just spoke about, which is eliciting a clinical history and performing a clinical examination, there is a learning objective of the sub-module. And there it says quite clearly that they need to understand the importance of taking a relevant focused history in patients presenting with possible infection, recording, analyzing, risk assessing the history and findings to arrive at the differential diagnosis, take a problem-solving approach and pattern recognition to arrive at a management plan. So if this particular module and sub-module already exists in your curriculum, then all you need to do is to leave it as is or lift it as is to when you design an AMR curriculum. There is no need for repetition. Next. So let's look at how we've framed each sub-module structure. So we, we look at the sub-module of eliciting the clinical history sub-module that we've just described. We have used a very standardized approach that involves certain knowledge domains that they need to achieve. So when you acquire a knowledge base, edu as educationalists, we say that you're, you should be able to describe, explain, understand. Those are the words we use. So. The knowledge under this particular sub-module is that the student is able to describe the common patterns of presentation, the history and clinical symptoms. They should be able to explain the relevance of travel history, explain the importance of eliciting a past medical history, hospitalization, antimicrobial um, treatments. They have to describe the comorbidities and drug allergies that may affect management plans. They need to explain the relevance of the extremes of age and physiological states, such as breastfeeding and pregnancy, on management of infection. And they need to explain the importance of measuring vital signs and performing a systematic clinical examination. So that's the knowledge base that they need. Associated with the knowledge base, you need to make sure that they have acquired competent skills. So there is a competency that they need to demonstrate. And so when you describe skills, you use words like demonstrate, show, record. And there are methods by which you can competency assess your students. So they need to demonstrate the ability to communicate effectively with the patient. They need to demonstrate the ability to perform a relevant clinical examination and assessment. They need to demonstrate the ability to prioritize the urgent and important clinical tasks, recognize the acutely unwell patient and prioritize and escalate, demonstrate the ability to perform appropriate clinical reasoning and decision making, and show that they are able to record all data accurately and completely. So these are the skills based on their, the knowledge that we have given them or that they have acquired. Associated with this, educationalists also recognize that, that health workers in service or students need to demonstrate certain or acquire certain attitudes. Without the right attitudes, you will find that education is by and large fails to deliver its outcomes. So the attitudes that we expect, that they show empathy and respect for patients, they recognize the interaction of social and cultural factors on the patient's infection. They respect patient confidentiality. They, very important, I think, to, to, in my perspective, to recognize your limitations and escalate appropriately and seek advice. And to be able to liaise with other clinical colleagues, microbiologists, ID physicians, physiotherapists, pharmacists, any other professional as appropriate and show willingness to work in a multidisciplinary team. When we educate our students, we have the, the knowledge, the skills, and the attitudes as an entire package. Alongside of these, we have also described certain assessment methods. 
Now, the guide only briefly describes assessment methods. And as we all know, assessment methods are of two types. There are formative assessments and summative assessments. Now, formative, uh, formative assessments are what students receive during the course from their educational supervisors and their teachers. It's mentoring and constant feedback. It helps identify strengths and weaknesses and areas for improvement. These may include workplace-based assessments, case-based discussions, management plans, discussions on clinical risk assessments, and examples. There is a, a, a group of assessments called directly observed procedures, or DOPS as we call them, and these where a student performs a procedure either in the laboratory or the patient's bedside and is assessed. There is also multi-source feedback, which is, which is a very useful form of a formative assessment. Now, summative assessments uses a formal theory examination paper and project evaluation. It's sometimes called a high-stakes assessment because you have to achieve a path mark uh, to proceed to the next stage of learning. Now, many workplace-based assessments and case-based discussions can also be marked by a path mark. So then they would be called summative assessments. But the, the current practical examinations uh, based on observed structured clinical examination or observed structured practical examination, the OSCE or the OSPI, are ways of, um, of uh, incorporating practical examinations in a summative assessment. So, we've included some teaching methods. It is not within the remit of this document to provide all the training materials, the slide sets, the lecture plans. This is a, a whole other piece of work. But we have said that teaching materials can include, but not restricted to, interactive small group tutorials using problem-solving exercises and case-based learning, apprenticeship, which is learning by doing, as we have all done as junior doctors or junior scientists or nurses or pharmacists while we are trainees, uh, simulation and role-playing for pre-service and in-service education, didactic lectures or learning by listening, using e-learning modules and massive MOOCs or massive open online courses and webinars, and also project-based learning by creation of reports, strategic papers, critical appraisal of literature. Or one or all of these, or more, can be the uh, teaching methods we use. So lastly, we thought it, was, it would be useful if we provided a sort of guide in, with which you could do an institutional AMR curricular review. And we've suggested a stepwise approach to performing this um, curriculum review in your own institution. Uh, the first thing to do is obviously conduct a situation and analysis, which would include what your institution is, is aiming to deliver to what kind of student. Identify all the relevant stakeholders and establish a coordinating group. Conduct a curriculum review or development using the relevant sections of this guide as is relevant to your particular institution, country, or region. So you outline your overall objectives and goals, define and agree on the methodology, and that is how best to embed the modules or sub-modules in your existing syllabi. Decide on the target audience of learners, whether it's going to be pre-service or in-service. Assess the existing local curriculum, compare with this curriculum, and identify gaps where, where you may want to um, include some of what we have suggested in this guide, outline your teaching plans and strategies, and then conduct a post-learning impact review with a view to improving the curriculum content. We find that having student feedback is very useful because students today are very aware, and as Mark said, they're very keen to learn and improve, and they will give you feedback. That's my last slide. I want to end by acknowledging the vast number of people who have participated in creating this guide. 
I cannot name all of them, you know who you are. But I would like to thank particularly the WHO Secretariat, the regional advisors and focal points, members of the expert group on AMR and health workforce education and training, Public Health England, especially for overall leadership and the subject-specific expertise provided by its contributors, other reviewers and contributors, the governments of Japan, and the Federal Republic of Germany for their financial contributions. Thank you very much for your time and for listening. And if there is time for questions, I'm happy to take some. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shetty, and an excellent overview of the history, uh, the partnership, the engagement, the role of the expert group, looking at not only the, the content knowledge, as Mark discussed about combating the role, uh, the spread of AMR and the stewardship function, but also then how to disaggregate that, and importantly, how to make it very practical in terms of the application and the use. And we're going to hear momentarily from uh, Professor Kumit Kafli and Gabrielle Hara on some of those applications. But before, uh, just a message to those joining us on today's webinar. We will try to have a, an opportunity to answer your questions. If you have them, can you please start submitting some of those in writing? And we will try to look and pick up some of those questions in a moment. So I will now turn to Professor Kumud, who is the uh, Professor Head of Pharmacology in the College of Medicine in Tribhuvan University in Nepal, and ask him if he can give us an example of how this has a practical application at a national level in, in terms of his role uh, as President of the Alliance for the Prudent Use of Antimicrobials. Uh, Professor, are you able to... Thank you very much. Thank you for the time slot uh, during this dissemination of the particular guide. And uh, well, I, I welcome you all uh, to my presentation. So I, I, I'll, I, I'll start with uh, uh, Nepal has different curricula, I mean, different training programs. Uh, we have uh, lower level of health workers training program and then higher level of health program and then postgraduate training program as well but the the, the content in about the amr is limited if we we have not analyzed in detail but we, as a as a as a as a faculty uh, uh, involved in the training undergraduate medical students and the postgraduate medical students for the last 34, 35 years, I, I, I know there is, there is limited content about the antimicrobial in the curricula. So that's why, I mean, and, uh, and as an as a, as a, as a APUA president, well, Nepal has experience of one training course uh, to, the, to the medical graduates and uh, uh, in 2001, before the this curricular guide, was, well, and the, and competencies was developed. So, so the what upward well, we discussed in the group that we might run the similar training course uh, to the to the to the medical graduates and the and the residents or the postgraduate residents in the different programs. And then we 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 submitted our willingness to WHO and. Uh, and, and uh, to, in Geneva and, 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 and started the, the, their interest. I mean, the, Dr. Onema, he, 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 he started, uh, he, he, he was interested. And then we drafted the, the, the first curricula and, uh, or the training program. So, so what do, we are, uh, this is in-service training for, as Nandini mentioned, it could be pre-service and the post-service. And we are talking about the, the uh, in-service training workshop, which is targeted to the medical graduates and the resident doctors, number one. And number two, the overall objective of our training uh, is to ensure the medical graduates and resident doctors can responsibly prescribe 
antimicrobials in the prevention or therapeutic treatment of individuals. That's what is the overall objective of our training. And again, as Nandini mentioned earlier, we have four, we have also proposed four modules. And uh, so what and what this yeah, so this this curricula the that this training package that we are proposing is WHO curriculum for all health workers, which has four modules, it will be is covered. Number and the sec second point, it covers the learning objectives under the knowledge, skills, and the uh, uh, and the attitude from each four modules. As Nandini mentioned earlier, well, the, the each objective has three. Uh, it, it covers knowledge, attitude, and the uh, and the skills. So we have incorporated knowledge, skills, and attitude from from all objectives from all four modules. And what we are expecting from the from the, with the training program, we are expecting that the greater depth of knowledge and awareness is, is achieved, and uh, skills in carrying out the task independently is also achieved, and attitude to preserve the efficacy of antimicrobials and to, to use them responsibly, responsibly is demonstrated. Now, the, 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 as, I, as I mentioned earlier, this WHO curricula for all health workers, all workers, uh, well, has, has been has been uh, has been the, and the modules has been taken for our training program, and uh, the participants in in this training program will be medical graduates from the public public and private hospitals, and also residents from the the medical schools. Uh, that's what will be the participants of our training program, and. And we'll be using the facilitators from the Ministry of Health and the academic institutions. And, and the assessment, as Nandini has mentioned, we'll be using what we are proposing is we'll be using MCQs, multiple choice question, at the beginning of the each session and directly observe procedures and small group discussions. That's what we we we, are, we have proposed in the in the training package for the for the medical graduates and the and the residents. And the, the reason maybe why we have why why we have chosen the the, the medical graduates and the and the residents because well the uh, in Nepal there are about twenty one thousand medical graduates registered with the with the Nepal Medical Council and. Uh, and uh, uh, out of that, only six about six thousand they have postgraduate qualification. So that means about fifteen thousand they are they are they are just with the basic medical graduation uh, uh, qualification, and and they are working in the uh, in the public health sector uh, in the primary health care center where they are the in charge of the primary health care center. They are prescribed, and and also these medical graduates they work in the uh, different level of public health facilities. That includes the district hospital, zonal hospital, and the and and the central level hospital. So they are prescribers. I mean, so they are the primary prescriber in the all level of the healthcare facilities in public sector, and not only in the public healthcare sector. They are also prescriber in the private health cells sector. And uh, well, we have uh, about 125 hospitals in Nepal in public sector, uh, and there are about 200 primary healthcare centers where these medical graduates are the primary prescribers. I mean, are the, uh, the uh, and then also we have a district hospital about 60 numbers, and there are about one uh, private. Health facilities. I think I will just end with the with briefing about the uh, why we have chosen the the medical graduates and the house of uh, the residents the of the postgraduate program because residents as 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 the uh, as the uh, in the department or in the program 
well, they 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 also prescribe a lot to the to the prescribe to the to the patient. Thank you very much. I'll just stop and. Thank you very much, Professor, um, for the excellent uh, overview of the application of the curricular guide in Nepal and the setting. And it's very encouraging to see how usable the guide is in that context, uh, targeted towards a particular um, occupation in this instance, uh, but very much to look forward to learning. And obviously, as you look at the the knowledge, skills, and attitude, it will be, we'd love to learn and hear from you in due course on the impact of that in, in terms of the, the setting for it. I'd like to kindly, we're getting a few questions coming in, but I'd like to kindly turn now to Gabriel Hara from Argentina. Gabriel, are you with us and can you give us a, a, a very quick overview on some of your experience? Uh, hello, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Loud and clear, Gabriel. Perfect. Thank you very much. In a couple of minutes, I will try to apport something. Thank you very much for letting me collaborate with this great group. Thanks, Onyema, for all the support and the feedback. Uh, for example, when we when be, have been performing during the, in the last two years, uh, the PAHO and WHO point prevalence survey of antibiotics in hospitals in seven Latin American countries. We did it as a kickoff and baseline initiative before implementing stewardship programs, making checklists, trying to gather up the future stewardship teams. We really found great differences uh, regarding antimicrobial resistant awareness and moreover regarding knowledge in prudent use of antimicrobial. There were great differences between hospitals, be, uh, between uh, different participants in the hospitals, even that uh, when hospitals that were around six to eight different countries were selected by the Minister of Health. So there were special hospitals with more critical mass to work and that's supposed to have labels to do the PPS and then the antimicrobial stewardship uh, program later on. Um, the um, knowledge was really suboptimal. For example, there were many important misconceptions regarding if a specific antibiotic treatment was adherent or not to guidelines, as in the PPSs. So uh, many were attributed as adherent to guidelines and really were not. There are many thousands of examples. Then the result is that carbapenems and third generation cephalosporins are the class mostly used in, let all, in most Latin American uh, countries. Uh, so this curriculum would fit great, really, one of the main reasons, of course, besides the fact that both core and additional learning outcomes are considered, as well as differentiation between prescribers and not prescribers. Um, for in what we should uh, do, I think, in my humble opinion, uh, for the pre-service curriculum that it's probably harder than the in-service curriculum to change, at least in Latin America, according to this experience with PPS and trying to begin with stewardship programs, national authorities from the Minister of Health should keep the lead through a designated special commission. Without dedicated people, this is not easy to do. Then convene universities, scientific societies of medical veterinary, etc., as Nandini perfectly mentioned, another stakeholder from every school or career to work in groups. Uh, in service curriculum, Line of work might be similar, but probably somehow easiest, as I said, because it's not the same through uh, to, to work to change curriculum for postgraduate that the pregraduate, the schools of the curriculum for schools of medicine, veterinary, pharmacist, etc. Uh, I can tell in the last 30 seconds or one minute one experience uh, showing this. Um, that without the high-level political commitment, this story would be difficult to, to achieve successfully. Some years ago, I coordinated something similar, very essential in the University of Buenos Aires, very essential, I mean, just we wanted to uh, try to gather up main professors of microbiology, pharmacology, and infectious disease from schools of medicine, pharmacy, dentistry, and veterinary, 
to agree the same basic basic objectives and contents only related to the, the teaching of antimicrobials. We were not uh, looking for all the curriculum that Nandini perfectly showed us uh, some minutes ago. Despite being hard to make consensus between different heads of schools, you know that everyone has their own idea, their own story. It's not easy to break that change of uh, positions and do something for, with all together. We could, we were, we would have been able to do really a good work after sensitizing them about the key importance of adapting contents to the current epidemiological situation. So we began changing things. We began to agree on at least how many classes, uh, teaching classes, you have to give minimal to uh, teach about antibiotics. But regrettably, as sometimes or many times occurs, due political changes, the project was suspended. Then what I mean is that uh, we need really to push uh, with the authorities to sensitize the people, to sensitize old people or senior people and young people about the need of doing this and work together with a great high level um, uh, position or support. That's, I think, that were my two minutes. At least hope we un you have understand. It. Sorry if I've been so rushed. So thank you very much again for letting me work with all of you and uh, to present a very, very brief experience and idea for Latin America. Thanks. Uh, Professor, uh, muchas gracias. Thank you very much for the, the experience there from Argentina and the, the Pan American uh, regional perspective. And indeed, noting your uh, experience there over many years and how the political leadership that we've seen on antimicrobial resistance more recently has really enabled this topic to be back uh, at a very um, central uh, part of the dialogue and now take looking at the stewardship role for the health personnel indeed. So really appreciate that, Gabrielle, and indeed our, our thanks to you and many of the other colleagues from the region that participated in this process. So here we, we've had the discussion around the tool, its, it's, it's utility, um, the curricular guide. We've heard two examples uh, from the Southeast Asia region and the Pan American region on the value uh, and the application. We've had a number of questions come through through the webinar, uh, webinar and perhaps then I can ask uh, both professors and uh, Dr. Shetty with me here uh, if we can just take some of those questions. Uh, Giorgio, what have, what have we got so far from our guests? Uh, there was uh, a question uh, requesting uh, whether uh, the um, curriculum uh, applies uh, to all health workers uh, or if it's targeted more specifically to medical doctors. And within that, uh, there was a specific uh, interest in finding out uh, whether it applied also to dentists uh, or, uh, or health professionals. And then uh, uh, more broadly, uh, a debate on uh, uh, what are the biggest challenges uh, in changing uh, prescriber uh, behavior. Uh, in particular in the context of low and middle income countries uh, and uh, within this uh, how we envisage the curricular guide uh, to uh, make an impact towards that okay i'll um, i'll attempt to answer um, both questions and then i can open it out to professor kafley and dr hara as well so uh, firstly the curriculum addresses prescribers of antimicrobial agents and includes all prescribers we have stated quite clearly that prescribers could be medical doctors. In some countries, nurses and midwives also have the authority to prescribe antibiotics, and certainly dentists play a very important role in antimicrobial prescribing. The principles that are involved in uh, the curriculum for prescribers are common to all cadres of prescribers. So that's one thing. Amongst the non-prescribers, yes, we've included pharmacists, scientists, um, nurses uh, who don't have the authority to prescribe in their country. So uh, as, I, as I showed you in my multi-dimensional approach, there are so many players in this antimicrobial prescribing and antimicrobial prescribing control arena that the 
um, curriculum has to uh, has to be tailored to all of them and cater to all of them. The second question, I think, is an excellent question. It is a question that I uh, I think will form um, a subject for debate for many, many years to come. How do we change prescribing behavior? How do we make sure that there is appropriate prescribing amongst our prescribers? And how do we change behavior? So let me give you my thoughts. These are just my thoughts um, from having... Uh, studied in a low-income country, having worked in, in several healthcare facilities of, of, of several economic strata, so to speak. And I think that AMR is not given, the study of anti antibiotics particularly, is not given that kind of evidence-based uh, drive to acquire knowledge as is perhaps the management of cancer or heart disease or even malaria and HIV. There are very clear protocols of first line, second line, third line, and it's, it's in a way simpler for malaria and HIV because they are single organism entities uh, or single org organism with a few species. And the management of non-communicable diseases has always had that that uh, advantage of having a lot of evidence and a lot of standardized um, training and um, management planning. Somehow for antibiotics, almost everybody, as soon as they qualify, seems to think they have the expertise to prescribe antibiotics. And I'm sorry to say that, uh, that when we are, it is taught as a sort of afterthought, as a by the way, it's not given the true importance and is not fortified by a solid evidence base, even though the evidence base exists in many of these fine clinical trials that are conducted. As a result, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, in many low- and middle-income countries, a doctor will prescribe an antibiotic based either on what his supervisor <coughs> or, his, or his senior registrar or his resident likes to prescribe, or the antibiotic is prescribed based on what, uh, based on the visit, the most recent visit from a representative from the pharmaceutical industry. And that true understanding of the mechanism of action, the advantages, the disadvantages of, anti, uh, of prescribing antibiotics has not, has been taught maybe in, in, a, in maybe one lecture and maybe there has been one question in an exam, and, and then it's not given that importance. So I believe that bringing this curriculum, which clearly states there is a knowledge base, there are certain skills you have to demonstrate, and there are certain attitudes you have to cultivate. Focusing on antimicrobial agents and antimicrobial prescribing behavior will go uh, in some way in altering um, a pro, um, antimicrobial prescribing. I also believe that every one of us who has uh, seen the light and who has understood how important it is to prescribe rationally, that every one of us act as role models so that we train future generations to be role models in themselves. Thank you, Nandini. Um, can I turn to Professor Kathleen Kumud and then to Gabrielle? And any additional points on those two questions that we had? Yes, thank you. I, I'll focus to the, to the second. Uh, the, the question is about the, uh, the I, 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 I remember my undergraduate training program. And as Nandini C, 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 C said, well, there has been limited, uh, I would say, the number of lectures or classes. and. And it used to be mostly the lectures or classes, but uh, the, the curricula that has been developed, well, it focuses on the, not only the, the knowledge and awareness, but also on the, on the skills and, and also the changing attitude. And uh, well, and this, this could improve the, the prescribing practices. But what I would like to add one more point, well, in spite of these, uh, uh, maybe there is need to to monitor the uh, the, the prescribing habits because 
because the because the practice or behavior could be changed if if the feedback on the prescribing behavior of of a particular prescriber is 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 given feedback to the prescriber saying that this is how you have been prescribing well I, I just thank you very much Thank you, Kimmy. Gabriel. Yeah, well, uh, thank you, but it's of course not easy to answer it in just one minute. Thanks, Sarah, for your question. Uh, probably my brief answer would be uh, beginning with antimicrobial stewardship programs. In hospitals, uh, despite the difficulties, it's maybe easier to order through stewardship programs with all the elements that our colleagues have mentioned education, audit and feedback, showing the rounds, um, pre-authorization with the teaching, not restrictive, not uh, as dissuasive, but uh, persuasive, uh, knowledge and teaching and teaching and training the, the colleagues and auditing. Uh, in the primary health care, of course, there are about 80% of antibiotics, between 80 and 85% of antibiotics are used, so it's more difficult. Then we had a great chapter about that in our Pan American Health Organization recommendations for the launch in the last year. And the most important thing is not only training, but some sort of accreditation. Uh, that the guidelines are really read, that guidelines are adapted, that uh, prescribers use the guidelines, uh, that pharmacies do not sell medications over the counter, because it's, you know that it's a great problem in our low and middle income countries, and that uh, the state, the authorities have some role there in auditing prescriptions, uh, in controlling the prescriptions, uh, and many, many, there are, of course, many issues that we could discuss. Uh, I have no more than 10 seconds. The summary is to put the guidelines, to put the wealth, the political wealth of doing that, to establish audit and training mechanisms, and to have very, very patient. We have to be very patient with this. will not change from one day to another, but this is a great... There are all great news, the stewardship programs beginning, the stewardship kill be, uh, be tool, the stewardship uh, toolkit beginning, and this training curriculum to guide us about how to do it. Sorry, I cannot do say more in just one and a half minute, but it's the future challenge if we might. We really will to preserve the, the small amount of antibiotics that are still alive. Thank you very much. No, está bien. En menos de dos minutos para explicar todo, Gabriel. Muchas gracias. Um, thank you very much That's to Gabriel for his intervention there. Uh, a couple more questions, but I, I'd like to, Nandine, talk to you about the the audience and the distance learning and the use of uh, how do we communicate and educate the broader public? Right. Yes, that was a very important question. Uh, how do we use our influence to... Uh, educate the public because many in many countries it is the public who demand the antibiotics. Now, that is a very large piece of work, and I know there are many bodies, including Public Health England and WHO, that are, have addressed um, changing behaviour of the of the of of patients and the public. We have addressed this in this curriculum in various uh, in, in, in various sections you will find, particularly uh, if I recall in one section where we say nurses nurses are the people who who have that that interaction with their patients all the time, either in the community or in the hospital, and they are often the the people who 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 presents the patient with the discharge summary, the instructions of how to take antibiotics when, if they are prescribed them to, when they go home, and instructions to come back if they are unwell. And in the curriculum, we have said, encourage, when you, whenever you interact with the public or with the patients, encourage training, giving them some basic information on the importance of antibiotics, how it is important to, to take the course as prescribed, to complete the course, not to, 
not to take antibiotics that are not prescribed because they are sitting in the bottom of your drawer from uh, a previous infection. These educational initiatives are there in the cu curriculum, but I agree that it is uh, it requires a lot uh, more effort and a, and a whole other piece of work to to create a a a, a, a training program, to, so to speak, or a training initiative for the public. And this can be done by distance learning, by um, by platforms on the internet where, where the public can interact with with those experts. And that is something that uh, is is done in some countries and in some in in um, in some organizations. Uh, I will stop there. Thank you very much, Vandini. I'd, I'd like to now just to bring in my colleague, uh, Dr. Onyema Ajabo, who's been leading this work with Giorgio. And Onyema, just a couple of additional questions there on how does the evidence and the curricular guide stay up to date? How do we develop user-friendly learning tools and aids? And just any final reflections uh, at the end of the, we've just gone over the hour, but some final reflections, if you may, please, on mm -hmm. the milestone from today. Um, uh, so thank you very much to all the participants and the wonderful panelists um, online. Um, it's been a very interesting um, hour to uh, talk about how we can strengthen um, health workers to um, adequately manage anti and control antimicrobial resistance in countries. And um, just to um, give some, uh, some last uh, remarks um, uh, on some of the questions, um, we at WHO usually periodically reviews its guidelines and, and um, normative documents and are certainly um, in a field where we're getting to learn uh, more and more by the day. This is certainly uh, one of the tools that uh, we will be uh, looking to update as new evidence comes up. Uh, we would also be exploring opportunities uh, to translate also the documents um, and so that it is useful across uh, geographical um, uh, different areas. Um, also, uh, on, on the question of uh, technology, that's also a very important one. Uh, we have uh, recently uh, published a systematic review that actually showed um, that doctors, physicians who were um, who uh, undertook uh, in-service training using digital means where had a better outcomes when it came to prescribing antibiotics. So we, um, and it is part of the, um, it is part of the document if you go in to see, we actually encourage institutions to um, uh, use um, methods and teaching approaches that are, are relevant to their to their to their settings and um and, and certainly um their climbs where you know podcasts and, and videos would would help to um address this and so we with uh, these few comments we would like to thank all the participants uh we hope that um these uh, couple of resources uh with previous um work um coming from the competency framework and um and um also other um, tools and uh, resources that we're developing with our technical partners that together we would be able to um, address objective one of the global action plan uh, to strengthen the education and training of health workers around the world. So we would like to thank everybody and um, you can send us, if you have any more questions, you can send us an email to workforce 2030 at who.int. I would be happy to pick that up. Um. Thank you very much, Onyema. So uh, that just brings me to the, the close then. I would like to find our guest, Nandini, uh, Mark, my colleague, uh, both our speakers pr from Gumad and uh, Gabrielle from two different regions, Onyema and the, the Georgia of the team at WHO. Most importantly, all you, those who've joined us uh, this is a great opportunity today to value the contribution of our partners and experts. Uh, there is more work to be done. A guide, a handbook, uh, a systematic review is the evidence, but what we're really most invested in 
is having that impact in national health systems to take evidence into practice so that we can spread uh, and manage AMR in a much more effective way. We have to look at some of the prescribing behavior as a result of introducing new knowledge so that we're able to undertake that. So thank you very much once again. We look forward to being back with you on a, uh, maybe in another six months or so where we'll be able to introduce some new updates around impact of the guide and also share the translations that will be available for all geographies. Thank you, uh, one and all. Have a good evening, good afternoon, good day, depending on where you're based. Muchas gracias. Adios.